Uh, and the temporary host, and we are recording, including fantastic typing noise. I guess you don't really see the slides in a big window, right? Yeah, they're taking up a pretty small portion of your screen. Yeah, that's a little bit annoying. I thought it would only... Definitely better, thanks. Okay. So, Maria, do we have um, a couple of people who volunteered to help take notes in the pad, or do we want to try and arm twist for that now? Yes, uh, my approach was to just ask everybody to share their notes with us later on. But um, you know, if people want to have common note taking in the in the notepad, that's probably even 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 easier. So. I don't know, should we, should we try to find one lead note taker? Anybody volunteering? So I, I, think, I think it would be more helpful to just take collaborative notes in the etherpad. Um, because if we don't actively engage in the note taking, it probably won't happen is my experience, or, you know, trying to pull everybody's individual notes in in different formats. So that, that's my suggestion. So I don't think we need detailed minutes for this meeting and we will have an uh, um, IB report um, published afterwards at some point. Yeah, so I think the, the good thing to put in, in the etherpad as notes is stuff that would go in that report. Yeah. So. Or at least a reminder to somebody to go and check this bit of recording. So I guess you have an eye on it, Stephen? Uh, sure, but it's good if other people do that too. I'm not good at taking notes because I, I always think I'll remember stuff and then forget. Is there a link to the Etherpad? It's in the chat. I'll post it there again. Okay. Yeah, the chat history is sure. not a thing. Okay, but given we it's five minutes past, uh, I would suggest that we just start. Uh, I think people have, like most people are here. Uh, I don't hear the joining noise anymore, so let's start. So welcome everybody to the uh, IAB workshop on um, COVID-19 network impacts. Um, this is the first session, session we have today. We have two more sessions on Wednesday and Friday. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Um, and we will go right on the next slide. Yes, so um, this is uh, also part of the ITF. So uh, the note well applies here. However, you know, if you have something to share <laughs> which needs other another framework, we can you can indicate that and we can see what we can do. But otherwise, you should assume the note well applies. Um, and you can see this also as a contribution to the ITF. 
Um, logistics, um, we have a web page, uh, which has some information about the workshop, which you might have seen because you might have submitted something. Um, it has also all the papers on there um, that we have accepted. Accepted. Thank you, everybody, for submitting uh, a paper. Um, we uh, actually we received a few more papers than on the on the which ha which have not been published or then are published on the on the web page because we only published like real full position papers on there if that was just like a short statement of interest or whatever we didn't publish it um but i think the papers we got cover a really nice broad spectrum of input uh and we're happy to have you all here we also created a GitHub um, repo. The GitHub repo currently has um, mainly the slides from today. Um, it also has already an MD5 for the report. So if you guys already want to put some notes there or start working on the report, that's also helpful. Um, then we're today here on WebEx. Uh, we will use the same WebEx session on Wednesday and Friday. Um, the session uh, is currently recorded. Um, the intention is to publish the session, the recordings later. Uh, and also use them potentially for note taking, looking up stuff. Um, so if you have any concerns, if you want to share something that should not be published, we can actually stop recording. You have to indicate that. Um, but other, otherwise, we would just assume that we can publish um, the recordings later if you're not indicating otherwise. Um, uh, you should turn on your video when you're speaking or presenting. Not sure if you want to keep on your video the otherwise the whole time. We have a lot of people in here. I don't think it's a should be a network issue if the, the tools are smart enough by now, but like feel free to turn it off anytime. Um, make sure you're muted when you're not speaking. Um, you know, that can be messy, messy otherwise. And for the queue, we will try to use the um, plus Q minus Q scheme in the chat. Um, so Yari is helping me watching the, the chat for the queue, and I hope we can manage as well. Um, the, the goal is have to have a very interactive discussion here. Um, but we are too many people to, to just speak, I think, so we need the scheme. And then on here is also the link to the Etherpad that um, Steven already published in the chat. Um, somebody is not muted and making noise. <laughs> so that person didn't listen. Well, <laughs> thanks. Um, so Etherpad, uh, we have the Etherpad for taking notes, but if you can also put your name and affiliation there, then we have a little bit of record who was here. That would be very helpful. Any questions on the logistics so far? Okay, then let's talk about why we're here. Um, so the scope of this workshop is really to talk about what we have seen uh, in the in the crisis that's actually still ongoing, but mainly also in the in the first um, peak of the crisis and what was the impact on networking. Uh, I think we have all seen many reports um, how quickly the the traffic went up in uh, March and April, because everybody uh, moved to home, work from home, and there was a big shift and also different applications that were used, especially uh, video conferencing, media applications had a big increase. Um, and all, all over, we saw that actually things worked well. We know that some operators managed to upgrade their um, capacity quickly. There have been like some small hiccups. Uh, we also saw in the EU, there was a request, for example, for Netflix to actually reduce their video rate and lower the traffic load there and these kind of things. Um, so this workshop is really to figure out a little bit more what happened, what have we learned, uh, and what do we need to improve in future um, from, a, from a networks uh, operator and service provider point of view, but also from an architectural point of view, what's uh, in the technology that, that we maybe needs changes or what's set up in a way um, to survive those crises very well that we should um, make sure we maintain. So it's really about figuring out what had happened, figuring out what was behind the scene about network management and capacity uh, um, extensions, and also, um, you know, what are um, what what are the general impacts of these traffic shifts um, to our um, architecture and potentially in any kind of future effects? And a little bit about the, these three points, we also um, set up our agenda. So our session today will focus on measurements and observations. Um, we have a bunch of uh, little, small, a few slides presentation from people who send us papers about measurements. Um, so um, this is really to get everybody on the same page, get some knowledge about what happened, get some data, uh, and have a discussion about this. The session on Wednesday will focus more on operational issues. Um, so really, what did the operators do? What was their experience? Uh, and what can we learn from it? 
And then on Friday, we will be a little more future looking. Uh, and we also have hopefully some time for other topics people want to discuss that didn't find a place in the earlier sessions. We have Colin on the queue. Thanks. Mary, I was just thinking at the um, end of Monday and Wednesday, can we just reserve a little bit of time to stop back, to stop our normal discussion and just make sure that we sort of outline what we want to talk about the next day so that we can sort of guide those agendas a little bit more? Yeah, that's a really good idea. Okay. Thanks. Okay, any more questions on the scope and the plan for the meeting for the next days? Okay, then let's start with today's topic. Um, so I looked at all the measurement papers, uh, which you can find on the IV webpage. I also looked at the slides I received already. Um, and the overall observations isn't that surprising, right? We had like this huge increase in traffic in March and April. Uh, we have observed changes in traffic pattern because we have different kind of applications people are using because um, of the different way they are work and they, they live. We have especially this very strong increase in video conferencing. Um, we have seen based on measurements, we can also see that we have that there have been reactions from operators upgrading their capacity more quickly than they would usually do. Um, and we had got also some measurement papers showing that there are still problems about last mile congestion and latency in some networks, depending on actually how the infrastructure is set up. Um, so this is just like the very high level view. Uh, and we kind of dive today a little bit more into the data um, and, and looking at the details and figuring out, did we actually measure the right thing? Um, do we know everything we know? Or did I miss, this, did we miss anything here? And as such, uh, we also have these presentations, uh, which I tried to structure a little bit uh, in this way. And there's uh, Christy in the queue. Hi, thank you. Um yeah, I just wanted to, sorry, you mentioned if there's anything you missed in the high level observations, um, just in terms of a shift on traffic pattern. And um, I think we should really acknowledge the shift in um, cyber attacks and the security aspect of what we saw in terms of the shift in traffic pattern. So I just wanted to mention that as a, as a high level observation before we go into more detail here. Thanks. Thank you. That's a, that's a nice contribution. We don't have a measurement paper about this, though, um, but that's something definitely something we can further discuss. Um, okay, so on the measurement papers, um, you know, I consider the order we want to go through this and there are different ways to do that, but that's the order I choose. Um, I would like to start with Oliver um, on the on a paper which he called the lockdown effect because they have ma various measurements from different kind of networks and this shows a really nice um, high level overview, um, getting some data, data at, at the observations I just um, stated. Then we have this little block where we get, go a little bit more into specific traffic patterns in, in uh, campus networks and mobile networks. And then we have um, papers looking more at interconnects at different points. Um, and then uh, at the end, we talk about this last mile congestion problem um, that I mentioned. So that's the plan. Any kind of agenda bashing for today? I can also quickly slip, uh, flip on the next slide. Um, so there's a slide with potential questions we want to address later on. Um, of course, um, your own questions can go here as well. You can look at the slides in GitHub if you want to double check this. Um, but let's look at the presentations first. And with that, we can start with Oliver. And I am will try to find his slides. Should be this slide set. And I increase this again a little bit for you. Um, Oliver, are you there and ready? All right. Thanks, Mirja. Then, uh, so thanks for the introduction. My name is Oliver Holfeld. And on behalf of all the authors, I'm going to present our paper on the lockdown effect. So what we intended to do was we wanted to take a very broad perspective on what is actually happening in the internet when the entire world shifts their behavior. So we have a couple of vantage points, an ISP, internet exchange point, and an educational network. And we want to look at all of this broad set of networks, wow, how um, did they actually cope with the traffic change and what was actually happening in terms of measurable observations. So next slide, please. 
So we have a lot of vantage points, so a lot of data to crunch. That means we have a lot of data crunchers that are involved in, in this project and looking at the different perspectives. So next slide, please. So what kind of vantage points do we actually have? So we have, we're looking at three internet exchange points. So one big internet exchange point in Central Europe, uh, one in Southern Europe, and one uh, internet exchange point in the US East Coast. So that's kind of the core networking perspective where a lot of the networks meet. Then we are also looking at a big internet service provider and here to get the residential customer perspective. So all the DSL customers that have now uh, have to work from home. And then we're also looking at a big uh, educational network in the Madrid region that interconnects more than or 16 uh, different research institutions, students, faculty members, and so on. So next slide to give you an, a few on how this traffic evolution is kind of developing. Here you see a plot that starts in January last year and it goes up until uh, uh, the end of June this year. And what you see here on the left portion of the, of the plot is more like the general increase in traffic that we have. So uh, as time progressive, um, we're more utilizing our networks um, however, when the initial responses and lockdowns were announced, so this is the part in the plot where it goes from like, the, the white shaded background to the gray shaded background. So that's um, in March this year when um, the, the governments imposed lockdown restrictions, we have a big jump in traffic uh, in the order of uh, 20 to 30 percent. And this is just because people change their behavior uh, and because of changes in life. So that's a big um, um, additional set of traffic that uh, these networks needed to handle. So this is what we see at this internet service provider. Now we have a couple of more um, vantage points. So if you go to the next slide, we see how this looks like for the internet exchange point. And here we see exactly the same behavior for every of the three internet exchange points that we're looking at. So we have a more or less gradual increase in the traffic evolution. And then once these um, lockdowns were announced and, and uh, the restrictions were imposed, um, then we have a big increase in, in traffic in the order of 20 to um, 30 percent in every vantage point that we're looking at. If you go to the next slide, um, then we can have a look in how this looks for, from the perspective of a mobile operator. And here, um, as we would expect, um, we see a slightly different um, 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 uh, picture. So once the, walk, the lockdowns are in place, um, the, the traffic is slightly decreasing. So that's the general um, observations that we can see here in terms of how um, the, the traffic level is rising. So um, next slide, please. What are the takeaways that we can take from um, all of these measurements that we did? So people's life changes and this needs to um, the advent of new traffic patterns. And most notably what we observe, and this is in line with like many of the um, other works and operators perspectives that have been shared. Uh, meanwhile, is that the difference between workday and weekends vanishes. So all the uh, all the work days becomes a bit more like weekends. So the difference here kind of vanishes the traffic composition changes. And in terms of traffic composition, here we see shifts. So for example, all the applications that we use for remote work, education, VPN, video conferencing, um, you mentioned it in the beginning, all of these applications see an increase in traffic. Um, I showed you in the beginning the plot of the uh, general evolution of the traffic increase, and this is what um, is mostly reported, and you mentioned it in the beginning, this is what we mostly talk about, uh, networks increase in traffic. This is, however, not the case for all the networks. So, for example, if you look at educational networks, if you send people at home, they cannot use the networks anymore. Oh, well, they use it for different kind of services, so they need now streaming, meaning that that the, um, uh, the traffic symmetry and um, the in and out, out ratios, they completely change. And then of course, 
um, if students are sent away from the campuses, then these campus networks are not utilized anymore. So they kind of see a decrease in traffic. And for the educational networks here that we looked into, we saw an up to 55% um, decrease in traffic. Um, the other thing is that we see here is that most of the people, when they look into internet traffic, they see they look at hypergiants, so the big CDNs and cloud providers and so on. Um, what we notice is that, however, only focusing on these hypergiants is not sufficient because we saw a lot of increase in these non hypergiant networks. But in general, what we find here is that once the human patterns and their behavior changes, um, this is directly reflected in internet traffic patterns that operators need to account for. So next slide, please. So what we saw here is that if we just look into um, the uh, traffic volume, then we saw an increase of about 15 to 30 percent with just a few days only. So that happened rather quickly. And if you now consider that networks usually provision for um, about a 30 percent increase per year, um, this is pretty substantial. Um, in terms of like how did the networks cope with that? Um, mostly pretty well because they had um, sufficient idle capacity provisioned. Um, but um, there is another effect that happened in here is that the impact on the peak traffic was rather limited. So most of the traffic shift, um, they, uh, they, they, they occurred in non-peak hours, which means that the valleys get filled, but the increase in the traffic peaks is not that substantial as um, the, the actual shift in the traffic. Um, the other observations that we made here was look when we looked into port capacities and how did networks deal with provisioning their links was that um, the track the the um, most of the networks actually reacted rather quickly to the additional need for capacity and they were very quick in provisioning additional capacity. Um, so, for example, here the Central European IXP reports and capacity increase of about uh, one and a half terabits here. So, what can we take away from this is that um, networks um, could deal with this sudden increase in traffic and these um, 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 shifts in demand um, pretty good if um, they had sufficient idle capacity provision and they had like a very quick reaction times in terms of like provisioning new links um, and, and uh, adding capacity. So this is why for uh, like these kind of bigger networks that we looked into, um, the, uh, the impact of the pandemic was measurable, but um, it uh, didn't really hit these networks. So with that, I'm at the end. Um, thank you. And I think we go to the next presentation before we jump into questions. Uh, we can have some questions if people have clarifying questions or whatever. Um, next presentation will look a little bit more deeply into especially campus networks. So that fits here directly. But we can also see if some, somebody has a question or already wants to comment on something. Yeah, I have a quick question on, I think, the second slide with graphs. No slide numbers. Is, so we, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so the next one? Yeah, so there's a downturn on the, the, the right-hand side there. So there's one line that returns back down to the, the normal, if you like, or the status quo. Okay. What, what was happening there? Um. With that, I would like to hand over to uh, Chris or someone from uh, the DKIC. Yeah, so th thanks, Oli. Um, unfortunately, I'm currently not able to, to view the exact uh, uh, graph. So which one is it, Oli? So I have in my browser, I don't see the, the shared presentation. So. Um, that's the uh, the second second plot with the the second slide with the IXP plots, and here it's so the dip that you're referring to is the uh, the South European IXP. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. 
so let's actually let's move on for now maybe you can check this out and let us know um, later on uh, yeah. uh, i guess it's also actually though. yeah Jen Benet and yes uh, on the page, on the last page, I have a quick question. Okay, uh, so here I mentioned that the capacity is uh, can be increased well uh, because of the uh, uh, planning in advance. But uh, you know that in the in the process of the COVID uh, nineteen, because I think the capacity may be. Uh, not a very big problem, but uh, you know, we know that the experience of the users may be not the same as usual. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if there are some data to evaluate uh, evaluate the experience of the uh, user uh, in this field. Yeah, so we do have uh, um, more presentations talking about some. Uh, places like Japan, where there was actually much more congestion um, and higher latency. Um, so let's maybe keep that for later discussion. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I would just, uh, in this case, move on. Uh, and we have Martino next. Let me find those slides. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Um, there you go. Hello. Hello, everybody. First of all, thank you for uh, all the organizers uh, for the nice initiative. I will present something about uh, our paper about uh, campus, uh, campus traffic during the pandemic. Uh, as also Oliver was mentioning, uh, the COVID pandemic had an impact also on the campus networks. And uh, very often we see a decrease in traffic, but not always. And uh, in our uh, network in Politecnico di Torino, we see an increase of traffic due to some specific uh, situations. If you go to the next slide. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, in our paper, we collected some uh, some data from our campus, Politecnico di Torino, some passive data using uh, a network probe running a passive meter called TSTAT that we developed here in Politecnico di Torino. And we compared what happens in our university with respect to other large universities in Italy. Here uh, on these graphs, uh, we see how the traffic pattern changed uh, from before the lockdown and during the lockdown. Here we have the daily pattern. On the top y-axis, we see the incoming traffic pattern, while on the bottom y-axis, uh, we see the outgoing traffic pattern. If we focus on the incoming traffic, this is uh, mainly what people uh, do while browsing. And we see that uh, in all the three universities, uh, we see a very uh, large decrease of incoming traffic uh, due to the lockdown because people are not uh, are no longer there in the university. They do not browse. Uh, they do not download content. Instead, if you look at the outgoing traffic, which is basically the traffic served by uh, the servers of the of the university, we see that in Politecnico di Milano and Università di Torino. Uh, the outgoing traffic is almost remained the same, but in uh, Politecnico di Torino, which is the left image, we see that the outgoing traffic really exploded. This is the red line. And uh, the reason uh, is because Politecnico adopted an in-house teaching infrastructure. So basically all the uh, lectures are hosted, are uh, distributed by servers inside Politecnico di Torino rather on the cloud. And this makes the outgoing traffic to explode. Uh, in the next slide, we have some uh, details about that. In general, we observed uh, uh, different traffic modifications uh, due, to, due to the COVID uh, pandemic. First of all, we can mention that we noticed the, uh, a large increase in uh, remote access, so in uh, VPNs and remote desktop connection 
for the internal resources of our university because uh, professor, but also technicians and administrative staff uh, were forced to connect from outside. We also uh, testified a large increase in uh, the use of Microsoft Teams because in our university, Microsoft Teams is used by faculties uh, to communicate uh, with students, uh, for administrative staff, for uh, storage and these things. And finally, the most important traffic change uh, was due to, as I said, to the remote learning infrastructure that we set up in Politecnico which is based on a BBB, Big Blue Button, which is an open source uh, application for, uh, for remote, uh, remote teaching, which is uh, based on WebRTC. And in turn, it uses uh, RTP traffic to distribute uh, the live lectures to the students. This had a large impact on the campus traffic. If we see the bottom left image, uh, we had uh, like uh, 600 virtual classrooms per day and uh, 15,000 users uh, connected every day. Also, what is important here is that the, these uh, traffic uh, changes are persistent. So they are not only uh, during the first days of the lockdown, but they uh, lasted all the uh, lockdown long. So if you see the, uh, the figure here in the bottom right, uh, this is the uh, incoming outgoing traffic pattern. We see that during the lockdown, the outgoing traffic really exploded while the incoming traffic dropped. But this is persistent. So also now during the second semester, we have a, a huge amount of outgoing traffic due to remote lectures. Uh, this traffic even uh, increased because we have all the new students, because all the classrooms are now working remotely and so uh, we have like uh, two gigabit per second of outgoing mainly rtp traffic if we go to the next slide uh, we can also uh, see how uh, this modification created some different uh, uh, traffic pattern in terms of uh, uh, daily and hourly pattern so here we have a breakdown of the traffic due to uh, remote teaching. So uh, outgoing traffic, we have live classrooms, uh, which are based on uh, RTP traffic. They are live, so this is UDP, RTP, and uh, they happen only during the weeks. And during the weeks from 8.30 to uh, 7 p.m., we can observe uh, up to uh, half gigabit per second of outgoing traffic due to virtual classrooms. But there are there is also a large traffic due to uh, uh, due to the on-demand content that students download because students can for sure download also the uh, the classrooms offline. Uh, for example, uh, during the weekend. In fact, we noticed that uh, during uh, Saturday and Sunday, we have almost uh, half gigabit per second of uh, downloads of teaching material. And this is uh, huge because, because before the lockdown, we didn't observe such a large traffic during the weekend. And so, so this is a, a very hard modification. This traffic pattern also has another uh, characteristic because lectures are scheduled to start every 90 minutes. And so every 90 minutes, the students connect and start uh, uh, watching the classroom. And this triggers uh, uh, new TCP and UDP flows that are born coordinately. Uh, even if the traffic in terms of packet per second is not, uh, doesn't have these peaks, the, the number of new TCP and UDP flows exhibit a great peak during the beginning of these uh, of the classrooms and this can be a problem for example for firewalls for some middle box for uh, passive meters for all these uh, kind of uh, network peak equipments they need to have a per flow state inside so this can can be a problem for uh, some network equipments if we go uh, on the next slide we can finally uh, study the performance that students enjoyed while uh, uh, using our teaching facilities during the lockdown. Uh, here we first focus on the speed, uh, the download speed of the teaching material, of, which uh, happens over uh, HTTPS, over TCP. 
there is some difference across operators because we notice that uh, fixed and fiber operators are typically much faster than mobile and low cost operators. This is the figure here uh, on the left uh, on the top. We see that, uh, for example, FastWeb was much faster than uh, free mobile, which is Iliad, which is a mobile operator. Also, we noticed that at some point all the traffic uh, from Italian students going from Italy to our university was outed to the France and then coming back to Politecnico di Torino. And this was a clear performance penalty that students uh, were enjoying. And on the contrary, we didn't notice a great, uh, great differences across Italian regions. Here, this is, this is the graph on the bottom left. Uh, the throughput, yes, there are some variability of the throughput uh, between regions, but not as much as we expected. And this was rather interesting because also in Italy, there is a large debate about the digital divide, for example, of, of uh, rural areas of, island, of uh, islands. In Italy, we have uh, Sardinia and Sicily. There is a huge debate about uh, if the internet is lower or faster in these islands. And actually, we did not uh, measure such a different performance across regions. And finally, we can say something about uh, live classrooms, uh, which happen uh, over RTP uh, in UDP. Uh, since this is not a batch download, it has a fixed bitrate at which the content is generated by the, by the teacher. And we didn't notice any problem due to the network uh, during the lockdown, actually. Also because the bitrate uh, is rather low. The video is very seldom above uh, 200 kilobit per second because uh, uh, we set up a low video bitrate to avoid congestion. And also audio is typically at 40 kilobit per second. So this almost never saturated the network of the students and we didn't uh, we the no big problems were reported by the students during the lockdown and yes this uh, was the last slide in general uh, yes we can say that uh, from the campus point of view it has been a large effort to set up this uh, this teaching infrastructure this uh, clearly uh, stressed the campus network to have such uh, a large amount of outgoing traffic, which kind of uh, uh, really modified the pattern uh, rather uh, than before the lockdown. Before the lockdown, we had incoming traffic and not much outgoing traffic. Now we have almost uh, all outgoing traffic. But in general, uh, the network uh, managed to, to carry packets. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing, especially this last slide, because there's a lot of discussion already ongoing uh, about how to measure user experience. Um, before we take Oliver, I have a quick question. Um, so on the previous slide, um, you talked about that the number of TCP connections would uh, challenge like fire firewalls and these kind of things. So did you see any outages there and did you have to upgrade those firewalls or did you do anything there? Uh, regarding the firewall, uh, I don't know if they had problems, uh, the technicians, but for our passive probe that, that is running TSTAT, which is a custom software, a custom passive meter, at some point uh, we had to increase the number of uh, cores because it is a multi-core, multi-threaded. We had uh, two cores. Uh, we had to upgrade it to four cores because the traffic increased too much. So. But I, I'm pretty sure that the uh, network administrator had some other problem. OK, thank you. So then we have Oliver. Yeah, I have a question regarding slide number two, um, where you compare the um, basically the incoming versus the uh, outgoing traffic before and after the lockdown. So um, and especially for B and C, so basically not the universities where you investigated uh, I guess most of the time. So why don't you? So why is there so little difference in the um, in the outgoing traffic um, after the lockdown? So in the, in the lower part of B and C. So why is it okay. almost the same? Actually, I think that this is because uh, uh, the outgoing traffic is mainly due to the servers, so the teaching portals, uh, and so 
this pattern didn't change too much because these are students going there to download the uh, slides, uh, to download teaching material, and this maybe has been rather rather stable. Also, I don't know which is the how is organized the infrastructure of these two universities, how much content is on the cloud, and how much yeah. content is on premises. So I don't know. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, any more questions? Okay, as I said, we have some discussion ongoing on the chat, so check that out. We will pick that up at the very end, definitely. Um, okay. We uh, move on with uh, looking into mobile networks a little bit more, and we have Andra here, I think. Andrew, Hello. Yeah, you perfect. Hi. Hi. Yes, now we can hear you. Hi. Great. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having us today. Um, so I have also Diego Perino joining from, from Telefonica today. Um, so yeah, um, I'm just going to quickly introduce to you a bit of our analysis on the implications of this pandemic on the traffic of a mobile network operator in the UK. So specifically, we're talking about um, O2 in the UK. So this is joint work with Telefonica Research, University Carlos III of Madrid and Telefonica in the UK. So specifically, we looked at how the pandemic unfold, unfolded in its early weeks within the UK and you know how all the government issued measures to actually tackle the pandemic impacted the mobility of the people and implicitly the way in which they actually used the mobile network services. So the period we focused on captures about 10 weeks from the end of February until around mid-May of earlier this year. So within this period, we actually captured a few interesting moments when the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus outbreak of global pandemic, as well as all the follow-up measures the UK government took to um, you know, impose social distancing, including the nationwide lockdown they declared on the 23rd of March. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to start with the takeaways. <laughs> so in our analysis, we actually found that, you know, in an effort to, to tackle the pandemic, um, the UK nationwide mobility decreased by 60% after lockdown compared to the last week of February of 2020. Um, so actually, people did stay at home. Uh, in the same time, their usage of the mobile network also decreased and we found a drop of approximately 20% in downlink data traffic after lockdown compared to earlier of this year. Uh, London in particular, so many of its residents actually relocate elsewhere, um, showing a 10% drop in residents after lockdown or around lockdown uh, and a steep decrease in downlink data traffic, especially in central areas of London. Uh, however, you know, the pandemic brought voice conversation back in the center of our attention. So people did start calling their relatives more and their close ones more. Uh, and we found a surge of about 140% around lockdown compared to February. Uh, next slide, please. So our analysis put together, um, you know, a rich data set that we actually collected from, from O2 including a general mobility signaling information data set from devices in the network from a mobility management entity um, and radio network performance metrics. So we capture users' mobility only by checking which are the radio towers to which they actually connect. So I must specify that this data is always anonymized and aggregated and we don't ever access user GPS information. Um, from these data feeds, you know, we complement with third party information from, for example, the Office for National Statistics, and we derive different mobility uh, patterns at the user level, including the home location of the user and a bunch of mobility metrics. So one of these mobility metrics, for example, is the user gyration, which tells us about the area in which a user moves, uh, only based on the radio towers to which a user actually connects. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is where we actually see the evolution in gyration. So based on all this information, we are actually able to observe how the mobility of people changed in the UK 
um, in these early weeks of the pandemic. So what you see here is the average variation in gyration compared to the nationwide average in February across our data set of about um, 16 million users. So we captured the variation from the 24th of February until um, 30th of March in this plot. So each bar that you see here corresponds to a different day. So what we observe is that although the pandemic was declared in early March, and you know social distancing was immediately encouraged, um, the mobility patterns of people did not change immediately. So uh, this actually dropped dramatically once the government actually issued the stay-at-home order later in March. So we note that after the 23rd of March, um, the gyration drops by at least 60% compared to earlier in February. Um, so the main takeaway here is that the only effective measure to actually convince people to socially distance was actually the countrywide lockdown. Next slide, please. So then we asked ourselves, what did all these changes in mobility actually meant for, for the mobile network? So to understand the impact on the actual network, we looked here at six uh, different indicators, you know, performance indicator KPIs. So we looked at downlink uplink data volume, downlink active users, downlink average user throughput, sale resource utilization, and the total number of users in the radio cell. So we only report on the y-axis the delta variations of each, of each of these KPIs compared to the nationwide average in the last week of February of 2020, so prior to, to the pandemic. So we show here only average values across one week. So on the x-axis, basically of each of these plots, each point corresponds to one week in 2020. So we look both at countrywide, but also specific regions. Namely, we look at um, five metropolitan counties, which we mark on the map below the legend there. Uh, in terms of the data traffic patterns, we noted that the evolution at the UK level, so the countrywide, is similar to that at the metropolitan county for more or less for the five different uh, counties we captured. In particular, the data traffic volume dropped by 20% or more, while the number of downlink active users also decreased together with the cell resource utilization, which makes sense. Uh, maybe unintuitively, however, the throughput also dropped by 10%, and we put that likely because um, of application throttling, but you know, this is just conjecture. Um, we also see that London actually made a discordant note from the rest of the areas with a steep decrease in the number of users and both in the uplink and the downlink data volumes. So we confirm later with our analysis that this is likely due to the temporary 10% relocation of London residents who did not remain actually in their homes after lockdown. So next slide, please. Right, so we, no lot, we not only looked at um, all this analysis based uh, on broken down for metropolitan counties, so at, at this, um, you know, geographic units, but also we looked at the analysis on geodemographic clusters. <laughs> and I'm not sure how much time I have, but I'll quickly explain what these are. So every 10 years, the UK runs a census, and with the data from the census, they actually classify um, output areas in different clusters. They call them output clusters. And what you see here in the legend, um, they are the largest clusters that we can uh, we can use. And you see them um, in the plot, in the map in the left side, you actually see how all these clusters uh, map to different geographic areas. So then instead of like looking within in the limits of a specific area, we actually looked at this geodemographic and try to understand how the performance of the network maps with these geodemographic clusters. So what we immediately see here, the first thing that jumps in our faces is, you know, the the uh, discordant that London makes with uh, with with the rest of, um, of of the different geographic clusters. So the blue one is the cosmopolitans. They usually map um, in in central London areas, and um, as you will see in the next slide, we actually found that a lot of the people who living in central areas in in London. Um, are going to move away. As I said before in the, in the previous slides, the previous slide or in the initial slide of the main takeaways, the voice traffic actually uh, surged 
we actually found a 140% in the mean value uh, in terms of the increase that we, in the total volume. However, this, this also put a bit of a strain on the um, network that actually interconnects the different operators. Um, that was quickly fixed, and this was basically showing the rapid response of the network operators and the service providers restoring uh, the, the, the quality of the service. So next slide. Um, so finally, <laughs> I show you the long progress temporary relocation of the residents from London. Um, so in this matrix, what you have on the on each of the columns are different days, and the rows represent um, different um, cities within the greater region of North London, within inner London. So you have to see how people from East London moved to other cities around London. Um, so you immediately the first weeks you observe the weekend, weekday, weekend uh, pattern, patterns, which um, disappear. Now, if we focus only on the line of inner market, you see that uh, the color goes slightly um, towards a lighter blue, which basically means that 10%, we, we see a decrease of 10% in the number of uh, inner London residents who actually are present within inner London after week 13 of the, of the lockdown. And then we see that just prior to the actual lockdown being uh, imposed on the 23rd, which was the Monday, you actually see a bunch of um, movement happening um, that corresponds to people moving, residents moving from inner London to, for example, areas like Hampshire or Kent, just on the weekend before the 23rd. Um, so, next slide. Right, this is just um, an update as you. Probably know and you've seen the news. There is a new lockdown imposed now in in the UK. Um, so they started with like tier lockdowns, and now they've entered like a full uh, lockdown, like a, a, a milder than, than before in, in March. Um, so we looked only at how mobility changed across these last nine months. It's like this. So if you think about the I'm not sure how well you can read this. It's not the best, uh, yeah, the, easier, the, the easiest to read. Uh, but this is just the evolution in gyration. The, the upper part is just um, the same bar plot that you saw initially, but now it goes until the end of September, if I'm not mistaken. So you do see that across the summer, you know, this um, social distancing kind of um, diminished considerably. And now we're, as we go into the second lockdown, you know, this, the gyration starts to decrease um, and probably will go down to the levels that we see in the first lockdown. You know, check different areas as well. Um, at the month, aggregated per month, and this is what you see in the bottom part. So, you know, the steep decrease in, in March and then a slight relaxation, of, um, you know, that goes step by step in the, month, in the months towards, towards summer, all this that looks you know, normal sort of in terms of mobility of people. And then, you know, we go to September and we see this increase and we're, we're analyzing this to see how, you know, how this affects the new lockdown affects the mobility of people. So I think this is it for me. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I think this is um, like my two high level uh, takeaway messages is that first, um, the situation looks slightly different on mobile networks. <laughs> than maybe for other networks. Um, and also that this is a lot of interesting data about um, people and mobility. That's very helpful as well. Um, you, you mentioned very um, briefly that um, also mobile op operators had to react and extend their capacity, but I guess it's like, I mean, like you cannot put up new base stations <laughs> just now, right? So do you have any insights what they well, did and how that worked? They did deploy 5G and I confirmed it does not co cause COVID. No, that's a joke. That's a bad joke. They were deploying actually 5G uh, across this, this uh, month. And they were, especially in London, they were extending and uh, probably you've seen the news, um, the press releases that ultimate, they were deploying um, capacity, especially within London, around the areas um, of outer London. They focused. Um, the issues they had in terms of capacity were more towards um, the internet school voice uh, traffic. That was short lived in March, like the 23rd, immediately. So the first week before lockdown um, and the week after lockdown. So it was the effect of um, a natural disaster that you observe 
when people just pick up the phones and they start calling. Um, and, and you see that even, in, you know, in, in huge, you know, um, in, um, earthquakes or, or natural disasters, we've seen, we saw exactly the same uh, pattern. And this, this matched that. But actually what was interesting was that even after the, the week after, immediately after the lockdown, the forest traffic stayed, you know, at, uh, basically was, was constant with an increase of about 50% compared to February. So it kind of remained at very high levels compared to before the pandemic. We have Yari in the queue. Yes, uh, thank you for this. This was really interesting data and really interesting presentation. I think you like that you went into the details behind the big numbers, like the demographics and uh, people moving back and forth between places. And I uh, just wanted to comment on one thing that we at Ericsson had, or some of our colleagues had measured um, traffic in different countries, and they saw a lot of variation. One of the <clears throat> possible reasons for that variation is how much sort of fixed network capacity or, or users there are in, in a country. So, for instance, in India, they rely quite a lot on the mobile networks. So, so during the pandemic, um, traffic there grew a lot in those networks. Um, and, and I wonder if that might be an additional detail behind the big numbers that one, one should perhaps or somebody should look at, um, you know, whether, whether people have their their fixed networks and whether that affects how much traffic there are sending or not. But if they move, let's say, from their home to their summer cottage, they might not have the same connectivity there. And so on. So, so there might be more factors to look at than I understand. I don't know if you have any of the this data on your data set. But. So I think I think it would be great. And this is something that we've been struggling with quite a lot to try to understand the why behind what we see, right? So one immediate um, assumption is that, okay, the traffic decreased in terms of uh, mobile network usage. So, it, you know, the waterbed effect should have been seen for, for the fixed um, traffic, for the fixed network traffic. However, you know, we, we cannot... We don't have that sort of information to check for the same users, um, so it, we're, we're not very. We didn't know how to, to verify this, so we left it at you know the conjecture level. So we could only assume that that's what happened. Um, but then it would be very interesting to, to be able to put together, for example, nice in the UK with with a mobile operator and check you know in the same demographics how. You know, if, if actually this waterbed actually happened, you know, the 20% the drop and the increase, a proportional increase in, in the ISP traffic. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Um, if we don't have any more questions right now, we uh, would go into a break. Um, given we're already behind time when we have some more talks i first of all need to ask everybody who's presenting next to um, speed up a little bit and be as brief as possible because we also want to have some time um, for presentation left uh, for discussion left um, but i would suggest that we really only go quickly into a five minute break so everybody can grab a glass of water or coffee or whatever and then uh, we restart with the next presentation And Stephen says in the chat that you, of course, uh, can keep discussing in the chat. Um, and we will also monitor the chat and try to make sure that points are captured in the report. Okay, see you in five minutes.
Okay, um, hard to tell if everybody's back. I'm here, <laughs> five minutes are over. Um, so we will simply kind of start again. Um, I noticed uh, that I actually didn't introduce myself and uh, WebEx is nicely hiding my name. Um, so just for the record, my name is Mia Kulevin. I'm an IB member. Um, and I would also like to uh, quickly introduce um, those people from the IAB who helped uh, putting this program together and reviewing this, the papers um, that Stephen Farrell, uh, who has been already talking and you've seen his video at the beginning. There's also Yari Ako, um, which has also asked some questions already. And then there was also uh, Ben Campbell, um, which is here, who is here today but hasn't been active yet. So you're the next one to ask a question. Um, and then we have also um, Colin Jennings here from the IAB who will share the session tomorrow, but he can introduce itself tomorrow, I guess. Um, okay, with that, um, oh, sorry, I forgot Colin. <laughs> Colin Perkins was also helping reviewing papers, uh, who's, also, who's the IRTF chair, sorry. Um, and with that, I believe because Jason just turned his video on, you're presenting perfect. So then go ahead. Yep, thanks. So um, thank you. My name is Jason Livingood. I'm an engineer at Comcast and IFT in the United States. And I'll be presenting today with my colleague Nick Feenster from the University of Chicago. Um, next slide, please. And we'll certainly go through this quickly. These are the folks that we are collaborating with. Um, next slide. So the high level here is that we were interested in data and specifically um, three one one. Looking at uh, both long term trends um, in uh, interconnect data and some near term ISP observations. And so the primary data source that you could sort of put in the general bucket of um, Nick, I think you're not muted. Thanks. So the um, uh, the primary data source, which Nick will go into momentarily, is from the Interconnection Measurement Program. This kicked off in 2016 and is still running today. And essentially, this um, is comprised of sampled uh, NetFlow data or IPFIX data for all of the interconnect interfaces across multiple ISPs. Um, and so, you know, timestamp the region where the interconnect is, and then anonymous peer IDs. So. Um, the data set that uh, Nick and his team have doesn't identify a specific peer name, just a, a random uh, anonymous identifier. Uh, of course, access ISP, total bytes, ingress and, and egress and capacity. So Nick's going to dive into this and then we'll come back to me. Nick, next slide. Nick, you might be on mute, go ahead. So Nick, Nick sent email saying he might he might have to pop into some other in and out of some other meeting as well. He's here, but we and he seems to be talking, but we can't hear him. Got it. All right. Well, I will I will jump into this then, um, <laughs> and we'll come back to him in a second. So the key findings here is that um, I think similar with the other presentations that we saw, we saw an enormous increase in utilization in a very short period of time and uh, at the same time new capacity was added in a, a very brief period as well so um, we see of course a, a steady increase in capacity in the interconnect measurement program of capacity particularly from mid 2018 um, but uh, beginning with covid we saw nearly twice the rate of 2019 additions. So in a very short period of time, all of these interconnect interfaces were having a lot of new capacity added. That growth continued, not just in this initial first quarter and a first quarter timeframe, but through the second and third quarter. So it has continued and, um, uh, you know, the, uh, let's see, if we go to the next slide, we can see a bit more so Nick, uh, are you available now? I see you're, you've stopped talking. Are you available to speak to this or should we come back to it in a second? I, so, I'm, you, I'm here. Go ahead, hit the slide if you could, and then I'll do the okay. last one.
Nick, you seem to be muted. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. So in this slide, we're basically looking at peer link utilization, in particular, how much traffic um, goes across the links from a particular ISP in the upstream or downstream direction, and then comparing that to uh, between two periods, January 1st, 2020, and then September 1st, 2020. And what you can see basically on the diagonal uh, is, um, is that um, uh, the diagonal shows basically that uh, would be like uh, equal ratios up and down uh, respectively uh, from those two time periods. If it's above the line, we basically would see an increase. And if it's below the line, we'd see a decrease in each point as a peer. And so what you can see is basically that traffic volumes and ratios change significantly between those two, um, uh, between those two time periods for specific peers. Um, this is uh, uh, data that we looked at uh, both from the ISP perspective as well as from the Internet Interconnection Measurement Project. You can go to the next, next slide. Great. So just to wrap up, um, in addition to the, the long-term IMP data set that um, Nick uh, analyzed, you know, just some individual observations looking at all of the detailed Comcast Interconnect data, we definitely saw about a third increase in that March-April timeframe, and it happened, as uh, other presenters said, really in a matter of days. So that was a year's worth of growth in a few days, which was astounding. Um, when we look at our access network um, to date, um, it certainly it peaked, you know, in that March-April timeframe, went down due to seasonality in the summertime, has come back up now uh, with return to school in the uh, August-September timeframe. But uh, over that period of time, we've seen downstream consumption or usage in the access network up about 13% and upstream up, up about 36%, largely driven by things like video conferencing. Um, we saw a huge increase in the amount of access network augments. So, you know, 400 plus percent um, in many weeks, um, which was big. Um, 500 plus uh, augments to our core network. Those are primarily at the edge. So think of the interconnect links. Um, we've done through this period as well, this isn't really interconnect related, but about 700 to 800,000 um, tests per day to cable modems in the network, um, just to measure QOE in addition to traditional capacity measurements. Um, and notably, so within our interconnect um, link types, one of them is settlement free interconnect. Um, and typically those would grow at about 15% a year, so a little bit slower than the norm, um, but those went up 37% um, over this period. And some of the notable per partner ones were interesting. So it seemed like our interconnect growth were heavily driven by specific partners. So it wasn't across the board that everyone was increasing, but that particular transit networks, content delivery networks, or web conferencing providers just saw amazing growth. So. In one example, you know, one peer um, more than doubled 115%, basically in four to seven days in a week's period. Um, and then we saw other platforms up 3,900%, which was just mind blowing. And uh, more of the norm was, you know, one to 200%, which is crazy to say. So that is it. Um, and for more information on the next slide, you can obviously click on the paper. There are more insights there, and we're happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Thanks. Um, as you were mentioning um, the speed test here and, and QE, um, so uh, you increased um, your test volume here. Did you also notice actually more um, QE problems? And do you have any kind of data or like uh, rough <laughs> numbers for that? Yeah, I haven't. Um, we didn't share that in this paper, um, but there is another paper. I'll, I'll post it in the chat, uh, paste it in the chat, excuse me. Um, and so it was kind of good timing that we had this test come out um, in early February, um, right before the pandemic. So we had a little bit of beforehand volume. And uh, uh, what we ended up seeing is certainly in some cases in that early time frame, an increase in latency, a decrease in the percent of advertised of speed. But in all cases, um, we, we still were above 100% of advertised. So, you know, we had that extra buffer as one of the earlier presentations said of capacity and it ended up getting consumed 
you know, we ran close to where we, we, you know, thought that was like the danger zone and then very quickly added capacity back up to re, you know, recreate that buffer, if you will. Um, so we felt pretty good about that. And, and that correlates with a lot of data sources like Ripe Atlas and their latency um, changes in their data and so on. So it seemed to work out well. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we felt lucky that we had that extra provisioned capacity. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly it makes my job easier and our uh, team's job easier with our finance folks who have always said, why do we maintain all this extra capacity if it's not being used? Well, it just got used very quickly and uh, that's why we have it. So it was, uh, it was interesting. So did you mainly measure um, throughput and, and delay or did you also try to look in, in like more application uh, metrics which are close to application performance? So our test did not look at application specific metrics. Um, they looked at um, upstream and downstream throughput, um, latency by itself, and then latency under load. And um, I'll just give a quick preview on latency under load. Um, it's a thing and uh, it was a big thing in the pandemic both um, on the LAN side, which would primarily be the Wi-Fi LAN, and then uh, on the upstream uh, network link. And um, we actually had, just through an accident of uh, where software releases ended up being, one particular device model, one made by one manufacturer, another a different manufacturer, different chipsets in them, so slightly different software. On one of these, we had, um, basically a, a, an AQM turned on, and then the other wasn't quite ready yet. So for a window of time, we had an exact, exact same make, mo you know, exact same model, excuse me, slightly different chipsets and manufacturers, one with AQM, one without AQM, with very interesting differences um, of latency under load. So that's in the process of getting written up now to, to share more information, but it's a big deal. And I think there's a lot more to be done to study the um, Wi-Fi LAN side of things. We've seen a lot of significant issues there. Very interesting. We have Jared in the queue. Hi, Jason. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I, I know a lot of people either upgraded their data, you know, kind of upgraded their speeds. Uh, and also actually, uh, I know several people who, who entirely switched technologies during uh, you know, as as a result of cable having much higher speeds, um, I'm I'm curious uh, what you you know how much of this traffic was just organic traffic growth and how much of it was additional subscriber base. Um, if if you can comment on that, if you can't, I understand, but I'm just curious. yeah. I mean, I haven't looked too specifically, but um, you know, off the cuff, I would say most of it is. Um, is from existing subscribers just because the subscriber base is so large you know it was like 24 or 5 million uh, homes uh, before the pandemic we have added a significant number of new customers uh, particularly with our what's called our internet essentials uh, tier which is a 25 megs down three megs up for 9.99 a month for uh, low-income folks and that's added a huge huge number of people um, but uh, even within the existing subscriber base, you know, lots of people upgrading because they're all working from home. Much like me, I went to a gig. Okay, we have one more question in the chat. I'm not sure, Ben, if you want to join and ask a question or if you should just like move the discussion to the chat and move on. Maybe let's do that. Um, okay, and then um, next we have David Clark and we will look a little bit deeper into um, congestion problems. Hi there. Uh, I'll try to be quick on this because I understand we're running late. This is a different perspective on some of the same stuff that uh, Jason and Nick were talking about. Go to the next slide. Uh, back around uh, 2016, uh, CADA and at UCSD at MIT started measuring congestion on links because at the time there were all these disputes between the big ISPs and the big content providers. There's a lot of congestion on the transit links. And now this is outside measurement. Uh, Jason's talking about data he has. We can't get the data from the routers. We have to probe. And what we're doing here is, a, I'll very quickly try to explain the background. We're basically every five minutes we, we probe a link. We send a TTL expired packet near side, far side. And what we look for is episodes of elevated latency, which tells us there's queuing on the link. So it's an indirect measure of congestion. And 
uh, we're probing every link we can identify. Uh, the data I'm going to show you here is from Comcast. We have data from most of the large American ISPs and some overseas. Uh, just so you see what the data looks like, go to the next slide. This is a this is a picture from the bad old days when there was a lot of congestion on transit links because of disputes with Netflix. And, and this is the signature we look for, a daily pattern of elevated latency, uh, which tells us that uh, there's probably congestion. There are lots of reasons why you could see elevated latency, link changes or route changes or uh, traffic management. So we look for this recurring pattern to give us confidence we're actually finding congestion. So we can look at this data and try to decide whether we've seen anything interesting uh, when the pandemic started, because we've been collecting this stuff for several years. So go to the next slide. This is a this is a picture from Comcast. And notice just for fun, it goes all the way back to 2016. And what we're doing is we look at every link we can identify. We don't necessarily find all the links, but every link we can identify, in this case, it's Comcast, peer, uh, con major content provider, cloud provider, transit providers. We don't, we, we're, I'm not plotting here, they're customers. And I took an arbitrary measure, which is, is the link congested for more than a half hour a day? And I just add up the total number of links that that are congested. I'm just lumping them all in one big basket. And so what you see is, you know, around 2017, 2018, you get these uh, huge spikes, which is where a lot of content providers were uh, dumping traffic onto congested links, and then it goes away. And you see 2019, it's pretty flat, and then you look at 2020, and what you can see, I'm gonna drill down, but what you can see is in the first few months of 2020, you can see that more links are congested and then it sort of goes away again. And then maybe there's something interesting right at the very end there, and we'll go look at that. Now, this is, of course, just looking at every link, but we can, of course, identify the autonomous system that's on the other side of every link. And Nick has to be, and Nick and Jason have to be a little circumspect, but you know we're probing from outside so I can name names. So, so look at the next slide. What I've plotted here is, the, I, the, the, the interconnection partners that contributed to congestion. And the first thing we, we need to get out of the way, if you look on the right side, there's this huge lump. Now, let me explain what I'm plotting here. I've, I've organized the data into two week baskets. And what I count up now for each interconnected party is the number of congested day links that there are in two weeks. So, so if, if you, found a number 14, if you look over on the right-hand side there, 14 says, on the average, one link was congested every day because of 14 days in two weeks. And that huge lump on the right-hand side is, is, is Akamai. And you might say, well, what's wrong with Akamai? Well, the thing you got to remember in this context is that uh, Akamai has well over 50 links. The, I, the, the reason I don't know exactly is that we try to identify link aggregate groups, but we don't always necessarily quite get that right. Um, so, so basically what you're seeing here is that there were two or three links from an Akamai server into Comcast that were congested. And in fact, uh, we did confirm that. And you notice it went up and then it went down. But if you, uh, but, but, but actually it doesn't surprise me that there might be technical reasons why two or three links couldn't be upgraded. Uh, obviously, since they have 40 or 50, there's not a business issue here. If you look around March, you know, 2020-03, you see, you see various things spike up. You see Cloudflare spike up, and, and you see uh, uh, Telianet, and then they go down again, which is exactly what we uh, saw from other data. Now, the important thing is Jason can tell you exactly about link capacity. I can't measure link capacity, but when he talks about link capacity, we don't know whether the link went from 30% loaded to 70% loaded, or it went from 60% loaded to, uh, it was trying to get to 110% loaded. What we find here is actual congestion. And when I look at this picture, and I look off into January, uh, September, October, up to the beginning of November, you see little spikes there. But in general, what I think you see is exactly what people are saying, which is bits of congestion occurred here and there, and people put in extra capacity. Just for the fun, look at the next picture. I won't dwell on this. These pictures are all in the paper we sent in. Uh, yeah, go go to the go skip over the discussion. I already said that. And uh, I, again, I went back to 2016 just so you could see uh, who was congested back in the period when there were all these 
disputes and what you see is back then the congestion were on YouTube links, Tata links, NTT links. So the congestion moves from place to place depending on what the what the business issues are more than the technical issues. Uh, so there are graphs for the other ISPs, major ISPs in the paper we sent in. Uh, in general, the story is about the same. You see some congestion occurring in March, April timeframe, and, and then it goes away. And in, in general, what people are saying is, yeah, we put an extra capacity, so what? Uh, go ahead, next slide. I think that's all I had. Yeah, that's all I say. You want to see some more, more pictures, go look at the paper. They, but as I said, for the US, they more or less look the same, so I'm done. Thanks a lot. I specifically really like this uh, methodology to that you actually look at congestion and not only bandwidth. That's really helpful. Any questions? Then I'm sure there's more on the chat. Um, thank you for now. Uh, we might pick this up later again. Sure. And let's go to the next talk. Um, next, we have Ricky. Um, uh, looking a little bit closer at the index connection to the cloud. Yep. Um, hi, everyone. I'm um, Ricky from Kada. Um, so this project, uh, we are measuring, instead of measuring performance from the edge, uh, we do a, an other way around to measure performance from the cloud to uh, SS network. Uh, next, nice breeze. So in this project, um, we, which is one of the NSF uh, uh, fund project uh, for in particular for uh, setting up um, uh, measurement for measuring the impact of COVID, um, actually we built a system called CLAPS to um, measure, to set up um, many VMs, uh, mainly in US regions to perform throughput measurement to a number of speed test servers. Um, we use three types of servers, Ocular, Comcast, and MLab NDT servers to uh, measure the throughput in both directions um, and see how the cloud perform is performing during the pandemic. Um, we start our measurement in May, so we kind of uh, measuring the aftermath um, of the pandemic effect and see how the performance going while um, the people start moving again, and also like some re lockdown events happen during the pandemic. So here we we are going to show some uh, very preliminary results uh, that we have right now. So that's nice piece. So actually, we find that um, the cloud is not as good as we thought. Um, we definitely see uh, evidence of congestion, um, not only to uh, to small network, but also can find uh, congestion events um, in uh, between cloud uh, regions and like big uh, access network like calls. Um, we can definitely see a uh, very significant throughput fluctuation. It's kind of like a diurnal pattern recurring every day that uh, we have the, the throughput drops in a certain period of time. Um, this is a download direction, which means it is from the ISP to the cloud, uh, which probably uh, caused by impact to like video conferencing application, like uh, uh, like Google it could be like Google Hangout um, in this uh, uh, in this traffic direction. Uh, so next one, please. For small ISP, sometimes it could be even worse. So these two um, these two data so from view of data of uh, from AWS uh, North Carolina regions to two uh, small regional ISP, one in North uh, served North Colorado area and the other one served uh, uh, South Colorado area and that the other one served uh, North Texas area. So those service area are more suburban area, and we can see. Uh, we can see that uh, the upload direction means that from the cloud to the ISP is mainly served the like video content and also uh, download activities. Um, definitely, we can see suffering uh, bandwidth degradation and user is kind of suffering during 
like uh, evening time. And the other one actually is we show a persistent low throughput um, except those bit like off peak hours uh, during this week. So next one, please. So apart from like uh, daily variation, we also um, have a very uh, high level view of a data um, between months. So we pick uh, the first week of each month to see the, F, uh, the median uh, download throughput um, between some certain cloud region and ISP. And we can find uh, some downtrend in the certain cloud regions, um, between cloud regions and certain SS ISPs. Like the left one shows from the spectrum to uh, Azure Central Asian, uh, Central One region. And we can see that um, the throughput from uh, like six to seven uh, spe spectrum servers actually decrease uh, over time. And we also can see like a slight decrease um, from uh, Comcast server to AWS, Ohio region um, between the three months, uh, over three months time. So next one. So apart from access network, we also take a look on the educational network because everyone um, move from like in-person learning to distant learning. Um, we also observe a uh, downtrend in a certain um, area of uh, cloud regions. We, uh, we have recovered three uh, different universities in uh, one of the GCP regions, uh, which is East, East Coast. Um, although some, we, we saw some evidence that uh, there's less user um, in the, in, in the campus, uh, but we find that uh, the throughput uh, could oops, uh, show some downtrend during the three, these three months. Um, we investigate, like, uh, try to investigate on this, uh, whether there's a route change or they may have uh, used more distant learning too that may cause uh, throughput degradation. So uh, next one. So to summary, actually, uh, we, we use uh, throughput measurement or speed test measurement running from the cloud to different ISP. And we find that uh, actually the cloud is still suffering some um, congestion events. Uh, show, we show some evidence of end to end throughput degradation uh, uh, because of the like, end user or last mile link is meant because of the performance network between two big parties in the network. And we, uh, we observe some time trend in throughput um, in the post lockdown period. Um, we have the data until October and we will um, keep working on the anal analysis and see where the time trend continues or it come back some later. And we make the data properly available. Um, it is now uh, we're still working on it now and we will put it online later. So in our next step, uh, we will also happy to um, work with other people on uh, correlating different data sets and see whether our finding, uh, see the same finding with, uh, with our data source and we may have uh, physical data and physical tests in the later, uh, in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Nick just answered my question in, in the chat that I wanted to ask now because uh, my question would have been, have you looked at latency as well or only at throughput? And Nick said, and in, in they have a similar paper where they um, provide also some insights into latency and they also see effects on latency. Um, can you confirm that or did you not look at that? Oh, no, we have not looked into that. Okay. Yeah, but definitely, um, I think one piece of the puzzle to look at. Thank you. Um, are there any further questions?
Okay, um, we have two more um, brief presentations. We now um, go into the part where we talk about last mile congestion. Uh, we get some data from Japan and then we also get some more general data from RIPE Atlas, also talk looking at latency actually. Um, so next we have Kenjiro. Yes. Hopefully, <laughs> yes. Let me find your slides. Um, okay. I believe those ones. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, this one. Okay, so I'm going to talk about you know, broadband traffic in Japan, uh, which is not so different from the you know, the other countries. So next, please. So this graph shows the you know the IIJ's broadband traffic uh, since 2015. So the green line is a download. So. Uh, until you know last year we had a steady growth and in this year uh, we have a surge so we had a you know the uh, the first wave uh, in february and then uh, in april april uh, may time frame uh, we had a state of emergency and then uh, we had second wave in in the summer, so we can see in the graph, you know, the the increase of the traffic during the state of emergency, and it goes down and it goes up again. So the uh, the but if we look at the you know overall trend, uh, it seems not that far from the you know original growth curve so uh, next please uh, so these are details from february to uh, june and these are summarized in the next slide next slide please so what we observed is as uh, oliver said at the at the first talk uh, the weekday traffic became similar to weekend traffic and a state of emergency. So the left plot is uh, weekday and the right plot is weekend. And the blue one is before and red one is under the state of emergency and the green one is after the state of uh, emergency. So the for weekday traffic, so during the state of emergency, uh, the daytime traffic increased a lot. And after the state of the emergency, it goes down again. And the, the, during the state of emergency, the traffic looked very similar to the weekend as people stayed home. And next, please. And this one looks at the distribution of the traffic usage per user. So the it basically plots are the upper plot is for upload and the lower plot is for download. So the it's the evolution of the distribution for the last 10 years. So if we look at the you know the longer term trend, so this year's increase uh, this is measured in June. So uh, after the state of emergency. So the the evolution, if we look at the evolution, this year uh, the evolution is bigger than previous one, but it's also you know, not so far from the previous trend. Uh, if we look at the, in the semi-log scale, so the download volume, for example, uh, evolved for the last 10 years uh, by the by two orders of the magnitude. So the yeah, so you know, ten to the ninth is a one gig one gigabyte per day. So these days, you know, the if we look at the mode, uh, people download three gigabytes per day. Okay, next slide, please. So in summary, so the overall macro level impact to the broadband traffic is not so big. So the traffic increased during the work hours, but it was still under the capacity. 
And the, after the state of the emergency was lifted, it's slowly coming back to the original growth curve. And we have many reports, you know, the talking about the minor issues, are mostly with the legacy infrastructure and the equipment. So the, in Japan, uh, the broadband boom started 20 years ago. So we do have legacy equipment like PPPOE. Loma will talk about in the next talk and the BDSL in apartments and old Wi-Fi at home. And we had some good luck uh, because uh, we didn't have any you know, real lockdown in Japan. And we are still, uh, are still hearing me. Okay. And uh, uh, we are doing okay so far. And also, uh, the Olympic game was scheduled this summer, this past summer. So the many infra capacity upgrade was scheduled early this year. So the so many upgrades were you know uh, already scheduled this year. And also for preparing Olympics, many big companies, industries push for remote work. So people are prepared. So these are observations from IIJ services, but uh, we have similar reports from other Japanese ISPs. That's all. Yeah, and uh, here I would suggest we um, just like go on to the next talk immediately and dive a little bit deeper into the latency measurements. Yes, uh, and now I need to find that one, this one. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, cool. um, but not sure what happened to your slides. Uh, this My one. Presentation would be very quick. There they are. Okay, so, uh, and that's great because Kenjiro brought all the, the background. Um, so in this work, we're looking at the last mile latency. And oh, you can go to the next slide. And so what we've done is we took a ripe at last press route and we tried to estimate the uh, queuing delay for the last mile in the trace route. So we um, uh, we just look for what is the last uh, private IP we see and the first public IP, and we're gonna say this is the last mile. Then we monitor those delays over time, and for a lot of ASCs that uh, host RIPE Atlas probes. Um, we are not really interested in, in the delay for just like one probe, so we try to aggregate those results per AS, um, hoping to see uh, if um, a common pattern could emerge. And this is what is shown in those figures here. So the uh, x-axis here is the time of the day, it's all UTC time because those are in different, those network are in different countries. And the Y axis is the aggregated uh, queuing delay. Um, and uh, the colors of the curve shows uh, different uh, measurement periods. So the blue, orange and green are in 2019 before COVID-19. And uh, the red one is uh, uh, during April 2020, so when uh, a lot of network were impacted. So I guess it's not a big surprise. We see an uh, increase in latency for the last mile. Uh, what all this network have in common is the, um, we see uh, increased delay during, uh, during the day. So all, all of these figures have a peak in the evening. So the, the top left one is in Germany. So the UTC is, is more or less the, the time in, in Germany. The bottom one are in North America. So the peak is on the left of the figure and the, the top right one is in Japan. Um, so they usually all have like a peak in the evening, but uh, during COVID-19, we can see the, the latency increase uh, during daytime. Um, I would say the... Uh, two bottom one just have like a slight increase. The, the most significant one here is in Japan. So the top right one where we've seen a very severe uh, last mile congestion. Um, and uh, 
in in our paper so we uh, just restate what uh, Angelo said, like there is some problem with the legacy infrastructure. So uh, using those results, we could uh, point out that the, the problem we are coming from there. And uh, so next slide. In, uh, in our paper, we try to uh, collate those results, those latency measure with uh, throughput. So in the paper, we use CDN data, but here I I've redone some of the experiments using uh, MLab and DT data. And uh, we found that the uh, throughput drops uh, are very correlated with the delay increase we've seen. Um, so on the left, you have uh, the throughput for NTT OCN. Here, the measurement period are a bit different. Um, uh, this is to match uh, what Kenjiro said. Like in, in Japan, we had a state of emergency. So the blue one is before that, the orange one is during the state of emergency, and the green one is after the, uh, the first wave. So we can see again in the throughput that uh, we had throughput drop during that time compared to what we had at the beginning of the year. And uh, like Kanjiro said again, um, we see that after the first wave, we have a bit higher throughput. And uh, our guess is that this is uh, thanks to the upgrade that was planned for the Tokyo Olympic. And next slide. So that's that's all the, the results I have here. So we found overall um, the, the number of, of congested network uh, we see using Atlas is in fact quite small. Uh, there is, we've observed only uh, about 10% of the ASN we monitor with Atlas that have usually have last mile congestion problem uh, before COVID-19 and this increased uh, by 55%. Um, so in Japan, uh, we dig a bit more in the result and, and found that the the one of the cause was the legacy network usually accessed via PPPoE. Uh, we have other results I haven't shown here, but the uh, using MLab or the CDN data, we found that the mobile network is unaffected, and that those two URLs. So the first one is the the paper with some more results, and the second one is uh, actually is completely unrelated. Um, it's it's some. Um, Measurement we've done where we look a bit further in the trace route. We are not looking only at the, the last mile, but we are looking at a delay between two networks. Uh, so it's a bit more similar to what uh, David Clark have presented uh, before. Uh, that's a dashboard we've done during the uh, uh, hackathon, a ripe hackathon. Um, but well, that brings something else for our discussion if people want to discuss that. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, um, we can check if we have any questions. There was like one question about what's the what the unit of the x uh, y axis axis on the previous oh, yeah. slide. That's, yeah, that's in milliseconds. Yeah, and, and okay. those, yeah, those values are very small. Um, the well in the paper we show that uh, because it's aggregated across like all the probes. Um, so it's and it's the median. Sorry, I didn't explain very well, but uh, it's it's the median value we observe across all the probes in that network. So that means that um, about fifty percent of the probes have uh, more than that value. Um, it's a bit hard to plot. Like it's better to see the the whole uh, distribution. Yeah. Um, thanks. I mean, there's more data in the in the paper. Yeah. Um. So basically, uh, that's the end of the presentations, and we only have little time left. But at least I would like to thank everybody who presented, because even so, I read the papers, um, seeing everything together, putting like the data somehow in context, um, I think was very helpful. My big takeaway really is um, that it's not enough to just like look at one angle. We need like all the different data to actually understand what's going on. Um, the other point is that I, I I think we realized during the session that we actually do need more data, especially about um, quality of service 
or quality of experience for specific users, for specific applications, for specific service providers. That's all different. Um, there might be uh, regional differences that we didn't have uh, enough data on. Um, and uh, with that, I will just quickly um, turn back to my own slide set. Um, and we can stare at this slide for one more minute. Um, I think um, I already kind of, <laughs> or we already detected that we potentially need more measurements, uh, but we need some also more digging. Um, but I want to open the, the question to everybody, you know, where do you see problems? Where should we look deeper? Um, what else should we me measure? What's missing? Uh, what's actually normal? What's, what's, uh, can, do we understand well what has changed? Do we understand well what the requirements from the society are? What the needed quality of performance or um, quality of experience is? Um, what are the differences? And then also, um, maybe this is then uh, sliding a little, little bit into the session tomorrow. We should think about what, when, what, what we want to discuss tomorrow. And did we actually manage it well or was it just luck? <laughs> So the floor is open. We have Brian in the queue. Cameron, right. hello, can you hear me? And I should, yeah, we can hear you. I should say yeah. the session is on Wednesday and not tomorrow. Yeah. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first point. Um, yeah, so I think one of the things that, that struck me um, from looking at all of these talks, which were great, thank you to all the presenters, by the way. Um, was there are a lot of sort of of common bits, right? Like, so, hey, the internet kind of worked, at least if you look at the core, um, and a lot of expected bits. I, I guess if you had said and looked at the at the Japanese home broadband infrastructure two years ago and said, by the way, we're going to need to um, uh, you know, triple the load on this network in three weeks. Um, I think actually, if you look at the investments that were made for the Olympics, you can see that people knew that that's where the problem was. Um, the one thing that that kind of jumped out at me from, from some of the talks about the, the capacity ads is that um, it was actually possible to add um, capacity at like, I mean, there was what Comcast had one that went up by a factor of 40 um, during the, the pandemic, but it was possible to actually do that. I'd, I'd like to, so I think Jason made a comment that, you know, the bureaucracy kind of got out of the way, which is one thing, but, but it'd be interesting to look and see if there are any remaining gaps in how fast it takes out to roll out the physical infrastructure. And it seems like at the interconnection points, there isn't um, any remaining um, uh, sort of barrier to physical infrastructure. But but that might, might be something that we can't actually answer with measurement is like, you know, what would the next big thing we'd have to do in terms of like capacity expansion be? And is that a, a technical blocker or a non-technical blocker? Um, I guess yeah, if, as, you know, you, as you're saying this, my question would also be like, if if we need another like 40 times capacity, is it still possible now, or are we well, now at the, we, at the end? We need it, right? Because I mean, like you can see that like over time, the previous stuff was clearly business limited, right? Because if you can if you can do it twice as fast or 39 times as fast as you were before, well, then you just didn't need it before. Um, but yeah, I, I'd like to dig a little bit more into that. Um, again, that's probably also a tomorrow question. But uh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, like, actually, my assumption was that a lot of people just like took the the expansion that was planned somehow and did it earlier, right? So there was already some kind of planning, and there was already maybe um, right things aligned, right? So not sure that's possible again very quickly right, like this. But that's also something we should understand tomorrow, yeah. maybe. And there's one of the talks that said, you know, hey, we we carry thirty percent additional capacity for thirty percent year on year increase, and oh, we also needed thirty percent additional capacity. So that that feels like luck to me, but but it'd be good to sort of like take a more reasoned approach to that. Yeah, definitely tomorrow. Uh, we had somebody else on the queue, but now I can't see it anymore. You already uh, No, Matt, Matt first. I was wondering how well calibrated the data is about our background organic growth. Um, back when I was really active in the IETF, it was typically 13 month doubling time. And now I'm hearing 30% per year. Um, how well is that? How stable is that? How well known is it? How well documented is it? Um, and one of the approaches that was, I know was used in the past when there was uh, big surges was taking the point of view that it, um, an unexpected load is uh, sort of equivalent to a failure and you have to reserve at least double capacity in order to be able to deal with failures and being allowed to eat into that reserve 
to deal with crises helps a lot. Yeah, so like, do we actually still have this reserve, right, for failures? Right. That's another question. Yeah. Um, next in the queue is Yari. Yeah, so trying to answer a couple of the questions or propose some partial answers at least. So I, I think your initial conclusion that we need more measurements and need to look at things like holistically, not just from one particular angle, I think that's exactly right. And some areas where we, I don't think we have enough is uh, uh, the quality of experience, uh, also application-based measurements. How much do we know about, uh, I don't know, conferencing platforms and such. And so um, everything that we saw today was, was really great. And it means that we have had those numbers, but uh, it would be even better to have had more. Um, by the way, I, uh, in my paper, I had some, some material on quality of experience. And like Ericsson had asked people around the world, like, how, how did they feel about the situation and so on. So I'll, I'll post a link to that. But uh, that, that's a sort of a feeble attempt or simple thing. I think we need much, much more. Um, the other thing that, like you, you were asking this about uh, luck or well managed. Uh, it, it's kind of like, what is your expectation on the risk level that you want to uh, handle? Like, can we do a pandemic and, uh, I don't know, a meteorite a hit that takes down 10% of the current infrastructure? You know, we, in some sense, we were lucky because we did that. Like, it was a big, big change in the society, but, you know, everything was sort of retained and nothing sort of initially broke down and so on. So, but do you want to build for that? Do we want to pay for that? that? That I think is the question mark. But one of the things that the Ericsson research actually did observe is that at least for the moment, the consumers are really interested in uh, reliability and re uh, resilience of, of the networking that they, uh, they use or enjoy or purchase. So, so at the moment, at least everybody is interested in, like, are you going to be able to deliver this thing for me going forward? Hopefully that can be... Or well, that sentiment can stay um, for a longer period of time. Yes, um, totally agree. Um, let's take Oliver Hofeld's question or comment. So I, I actually want to make a comment that goes a little bit into Brian's direction. So to me, the question is like, on what level of granularity are we talking? Uh, most of the results, also the results that we have shared are uh, at the granularity of we take the ISP or the IXP as, as, as a whole. And um, this level can be, or this picture can completely change if you look into individual users, individual peering links, and so on. And of course, we have seen these cases where, uh, you know, um, smaller smaller enterprises were kind of like not really planning for this pandemic to happen. And then if they send all of their employees to home office, then um, of course the, um, the small pipe that they have purchased, um, it went from like a medium utilization to like uh, a really high utilization. So um, of course they can have like a, this can really have like an effect on them but if you look at the if you take do a statistical analysis on like um, the operator or the network as a whole with like a, a large set of peering links then we see like um, um, a, a kind of a different uh, perspective for the majority of the cases so I, I guess that's like one thing to discuss for the Wednesday session is like the level of granularity um, and how like uh, you know, how deep should we dig into like um, individual users that really suffered um, individual links that went to full utilization? Um, so these kind of things. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like that was also one thing is actually understanding what the problems are, understanding all the details, understanding um, who suffers. But then the other thing is actually the big picture, right? Is it is it the architecture? Is it the technology where the limitations are? Or is it a business question? Um, I think that's also um, a good point. We hopefully come to some insights at the end of the workshop. Um, I still have uh, Cullen in the queue. Yeah, I just want to basically wrap Out of time. I, I, okay, I, perfect. Yeah, I don't want to comment on this. I just want to tell people if you would like a less than, you know, seven minutes or less lightning talk slot on the on Wednesday to talk about one of the operational issues, 
um, send slides or requests either to me, Fluffy at Cisco.com, or to and I'll put my email in the chat or or to the, the program committee list. Um, and let's uh, see if we can have some more time for discussion of this and that stuff on Wednesday. Yeah, and I have a request. I would like to ask people to actually go to the um, note taking pad that we have and and add comments there on things that um, you think we should measure, we should do, should, we should care about. So we don't all forget about it immediately. And we can look at that on Wednesday again. Um, yeah, and with that, we're at the end of this session. Um, Thanks everybody for joining. Thanks everybody for presenting. Thanks everybody for comments. We didn't have as much time for discussions as I was hoping for, but it was also a little bit expected to be honest. Um, but I hope you all enjoyed the chat session. I did a lot and I think we're now well prepared to have discussions on Wednesday. Any last words from anybody else from the program committee? Okay, then same time on Wednesday, same link. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you, Miria, and all the organizers. <laughs> Thank you.